As the moderator of today's panel, organized as part of the New Directions in New Research at the University of Pittsburgh, I would like to welcome you all to the panel, Imperial Pasts in the Present, Affect, Indigeneity and Memory. My name is Aslı Ilsiz, and I am Associate Professor of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at New York University. And uh, before I say anything further about our panel, uh, I would like to take a brief moment uh, and thank on behalf of our panel, uh, members, including myself, uh, to, the, to, to the Center of, uh, for Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies and the Association for Slavic and East European and Eurasian Studies at the University of Pittsburgh for their invitation and for making this um, panel happen. In addition, we also would like to thank uh, the co-sponsors of this event, Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies at the University of Chicago, Center for Russia, East Europe, and Central Asia, University of Wisconsin-Madison, Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, University of Kansas, Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, University of Michigan, Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, University of Texas at Austin, uh, Center for Slavic, East European, and um, Eurasian Studies, Ohio State University, Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies, Harvard University, Inner Asian and Uralic National Resource Center, Indiana University, Bloomington, Robert F. Brian uh, Burns, um, Russian and East European Institute, Indiana University, Bloomington, Institute of Slavic, East European and Eurasian Studies, University of California, Berkeley, Russian, East European and Eurasian Center, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. It took a whole country to make this panel happen. So we are grateful uh, for them, uh, for their support. Uh, and, uh, and, and within this uh, context specifically, uh, I also would like to extend our thanks to Zhuzha Magdo, uh, the Associate Director of the Center, as well as the um, uh, staff members of the Center for their work in uh, putting into this initiative on intersectionality in focus and for ma magically making everything appear to be so easy. So it is my great pleasure to introduce today's panelists, Hakim al Rustom and, um, and uh, Vladislav Beronia. Hakim al Rustom is uh, the Alex Manugian Professor of Modern Armenian History and Assistant Professor of Anthropology at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Professor al Rustom earned his PhD from the London School of Economics and Social Anthropology. His main research interests are the anthropology of history, uh, examining the relationships between indigenous populations and settler colonialists, migration and displacement, historical ethnographies, and silences and absences in post-Ottoman societies. Professor Al Rustom is uh, currently working on a book on the unwritten histories of the Armenian citizens of Turkey to depict the history of indigenous populations that continue to face erasures in the wake of the establishment of nation states. The title of his paper today is more than land, more than genocide, the denativization of Armenians. The second panelist in our pa uh, is um, our, our presenter is Vladislav uh, Beronia, who is an assistant professor of Slavic and Eurasian studies at the University of Texas, uh, Austin. And he received his PhD in Slavic language and, uh, and literatures from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Uh, speaking of intersectionality, we all intersect in an arbor, it seems. Um, and Professor Beronia's um, primary research interests range from uh, contemporary comics and popular music to postmodern metafiction, psychoanalytical approaches to trauma, and Marxist aesthetics. He has published and edited many articles, book reviews, and translations, and his current book project, Archival Fictions, Cultural Memory, Literary imaginations and the uh, imagination and the Yugoslav wars examines how post Yugoslav writers and artists critically deploy the archive as a governing metaphor for the loss and preservation of cultural memory in post communist Eastern Europe. Professor Beronia's courses highlight literature, cinema, music, and cultural identity in the Balkans, modern warfare and comics, and nostalgia and popular culture in Eastern Europe and uh, the United States. The title of his paper today is Yugo Nostalgia, A Queer Feeling, Reading the Traces of Socialist Modernity in Boris Kralia's My Belgrade. 
without further ado, um, I would like to uh, leave the stage, as it were, um, or the screen to uh, our first presenter, um, uh, Hakim Arustum. Thank you very much, Asli. It's uh, an honor to be with uh, you and Vlad on the same uh, panel. So I'm going to uh, start by introducing to you Huri, uh, the Armenian woman that was born and raised in the village of uh, Sasun in the Batman province of Turkey, and now lives in Istanbul. Uh, it is through her life that I navigate today's story about the predicament of Ottoman Armenians in post-Ottoman Turkey. Huri and I first met in the Armenian church in the Gadik Pasha district of Istanbul, where uh, we had arranged to meet after the liturgy on a cold Sunday in January 2009. It was around the second anniversary of the murder of the Armenian journalist Heran Dink two days earlier in 2007. I was intri first introduced to Huri through a common friend who described her as keen on documenting the fading Armenian heritage of her village, Sasun. For years, she has been recording the Armenian dialect of older Sasun women, uh, who immigrated to uh, Istanbul. My own heritage is dying out and the Armenian dialect of Sasun too is slowly being forgotten, she said with a concerned tone. After losing her father and immigrated to Istanbul, she realized that she had started losing her ties with her cultural and social past in Anatolia. This is why she started a project to document the Sasun's Armenian cultural specificities. Huri, as the daughter of the Armenian survi survivors, speak of the ramification of living in the shadow of the genocide in Turkey. Her life speaks of the Armenian predicament in the aftermath of genocide, where they not only faced systematic annihilation in the last years of the Ottoman Empire, but an ongoing process of erasure, displacement, dispossession, and systematic amnesia endured through their lives as citizens of the Republic of Turkey a process that I call denativization. Denativization is not the sole outcome of the Turkish policies of erasure to erase the ar remaining Armenians of the land. The Kurdish tribal leaders in the Southeast, as well as the Armenian community institutions in Istanbul were also participants in this process. The experience of the ordinary, the mundane, and the outliers that don't fit within the binaries created by nationalisms have been silenced and erased yet could be recovered through storytelling. Writing in 1936, Walter Benjamin raises the concern about the decline of the experiential in favor of what is seen and written as factual and evidence. In, his, in the essay, The Storyteller, Benjamin speak that the medium through which we tell stories have been declining. He also declares in another essay written in the very same year, the death of the aura of the works of art in the age of mechanical reproducibility. With both the decline of the aura and storytelling goes the ability to exchange experience. Huri and her family, like the majority of Armenians, Armenian survivors in Turkey were not the people that the Turkish state or Armenian institutions care to archive, to remember, or to write about. Both are argued denativized them from their Armenianness in very different ways, because Armenians and Turks, just like the majority of post-Ottoman societies, were bound by the gravity of the nation state that undermines diversity, destroys relationship between, between neighbors, and homogenize, standardize, and transforms coexistence into a binary of the self and the other the friend and the enemy, the Turk and the Armenian, the Turk and the Greek, the Arab and the Jew, and the list is endless. So what is denitivization? The Armenian critic Mark Nishanyan prefers, refers to, prefers to call the Armenian genocide the catastrophe. For Nishanyan, the term genocide comes with limitations, arguing that the essence of genocide is denial because the perpetrators often erase every trace of their act, he says. Nishanian argues that ultimately the survivors have to resort to the archives of the perpetrator to prove the crimes they were subjected to in the face of the perpetrator's denial. 
While genocide can be an accurate term to describe the events from a legal perspective and for comparative studies of mass violence, it remains focused on the crimes of the perpetrators. As genocide is framed within the legal framework of evidence and facts, it potentially silences the lives and stories that were seen to be unworthy or impossible to be documented or archived. Denatabization speaks not of facts or evidenced history, rather of the experiences of the mundane and the forgotten individuals, the refuse of history, such as post-Ottoman Armenians who continue to have organic relationship with and make indigenous claims to the land from which they were dispossessed. For denitivization as a form of elimination goes beyond the genocidal violence and the denial of civil rights of citizens. Denitivization articulates the experiences of those who were transformed into a foreign minority while still living on the land as the nation state claimed sovereignty in the name of a national collective that excluded them. The term also expands the concept of cleansing to include not only genocide, expulsion, forced migration and assimilation, but also the attempts to sever their historical and organic connection to the land discursively by retelling their history from the vantage point of the nation state. It is with people like Huri in mind that I coined the term denitivization to listen to the silenced Armenian stories and bring to the foreground the Armenian catastrophe as an ongoing process that is not limited to an event framed by the genocide with a beginning and an end, rather accounting for its continuous afterlives. This is not to undermine the genocide as a, as a catastrophic event uh, that changed the course of the lives of a million who were killed and hundreds of, th of thousands who survived without family, kin, homes, and homeland. Rather, as the Palestinian scholar Rana Barakat says, it is to write about violence without being defined by it. It is to narrate the experiences of the survivors without framing them within their victimhood. I will now use four fragments of Huri's story to try to do that. The first, how did Armenians in Sasun survive? Huri says, quote, the loyalty to the A, the landlord or a village head in Turkish, was central to an Armenian survival in our region. Disobedience to the A could be life-threatening with risks of expulsion from the region. She continues explaining that after 1915, Armenians belonged to whoever saved them. We were lucky. We were saved by a good tribe, Ashiret, uh, who are known to be one of the best because it protected its Armenians. They were, she says, they were our sahib, our owners, to speak of physical ownership. It was up to the Ah to choose for Armenians who they marry, the names of their newborns, the religious affiliation they will get on their government identity card, who gets registered as Armenian and who as Muslim. She explains. So this is how Armenians were Islamicized and assimilated and survived in Anatolia. The second point, why did Armenians leave Sasso? The abduction of Armenian girls was a common theme in the stories I heard. Huri emphasized that in, it was cheaper to kidnap an Armenian for marriage than kidnap or marry a Kurdish girl because the rules that govern the relationship between Kurd the Kurdish tribes did not apply to Armenian women in Turkey's Southeast. As the Kurdish tribe became our owners or the owners of Armenians, they saved. They saved. It was up to the uh, to take important decisions in their lives. Huri explains. This happened not only to unmarried girls, but to married women too. My aunt was kidnapped while her husband was in the military. She was immediately taken by her mother-in-law and left for Istanbul. In the 1950s, migration to Istanbul reached a peak due to the increase in kidnapping Armenian incidents by Kurds. Yet it is not only the conflict between Armenians and Kurds that prompted the Armenian migration out of Anatolia. 
The, in the early years, the Republican regime wanted to consolidate its power in Kurdish majority regions through di diminishing the Kurdish social and political power in the Southeast. The violence of the Turkish state has also prompted uh, Armenians either to leave for Istanbul or, the, or where they were force, forcefully relocated by the states in different parts of the country. In the latter context, Armenians were treated as Kurds. Huri explains, seven or eight years after the Kurd Kurdish rebellion of 1925, the state came to tax the A, ah, who might have been an Arab or a Kurd. See, in the region, it, it is difficult to say who's an Arab, a Turk, or a Kurd. The army used to come to destroy villages, and as villagers go up the mountains in the summer, many children, Armenians and other, died because their parents put their hand hands on their mouths so they wouldn't cry and be heard by the soldiers. Huri narrates how her family was forced out of Sassoon as a result of the settlement law, the Iskan Kanunu of 1934, uh, that was meant to fragment the Kurdish villages and thus contain the Kurdish uprising. So in 1938, the family uh, uh, was forced to leave to the Western Anatolian city of Izmir and they lived there between 1938 and 1948 as Kurds, and they weren't even able to say that they are Armenian. For cause, the causes for leaving Anatolia vary among Armenians, but many point to the conflict with the Kurdish population and the refusal of the Turkish state security system to protect Armenians in such conflict. In 1972, her father fell ill and died, and therefore, she says, my mother and I became vulnerable to kidnapping. If you are living in Eastern Anatolia, it, is always, it always depends on the R. That would determine if one would stay in the village or forced to convert to Islam or to leave the village altogether. So leaving Sassoon was a shared predicament for many villagers. Huri said that the people started leaving Sassoon in the 1950s because of the kidnapping, and later in 19, after 1966 because of the, uh, the, the earthquake in, uh, in the Mush province. Uh, and then also in her own village, Sassoon, there had been two killings of Armenians that encouraged more people uh, to continue to immigrate out of uh, Sassoon to Istanbul. The third point, the third point is labeling events. Huri explained to me the many ways in which the variety of experiences during the genocide produced a range of local labels to determine the experiences in contrast to the standardized legal term genocide. Local variation in different villages present, present us with more specific incidences each reflecting its own unique and local occurrence. Armenians were not annihilated uniformly. While the Turkish state policy of cleansing Armenians were systematic, the methods in different parts of Anatolia varied. For example, she was speaking uh, about how in her own village in Sassun, they refer to the Armenian genocide with the term ferman, a Persian word used in Ottoman Turkish to mean a decree or an edict issued by a sovereign ruler. So the genocide is referred to as, as the, the, the Berinji Ferman or the, the first edict or with the word Buyuk Ferman, meaning great, uh, the great edict to describe the 1915 uh, events. And then she said in, in, a, in a place like Diyarbakir, for example, they refer to it uh, with the Arabic word Kafle, which coming from the Arabic kafila, meaning a caravan. She explains that because this is the way people experience the genocide, as people in a caravan, people marching out of Diyarbakir into the Syrian, uh, into the Syrian desert. In a different part of Anatolia, they would refer to it as sefer berlik, meaning uh, mobilization of the military uh, uh, in preparation for war. Uh, and I will. In my concluding remark, I will come back and comment on those uh, variations. Then later, uh, she explains that in the 1930s, the, under the resettlement law of 19, uh, the 1930s, they, they referred to 
uh, the, the, the forced expulsion of Armenians out of Sasun as the Ikinji Ferman, meaning the second decree. And therefore they positioned the, they positioned the Armenian genocide of 1915 and the resettlement law that forced them out of Sasun in a, in a, in a, in a, in a linear consequences, one being the first Ferman and one being the second. The four and last point is life, her life in Istanbul. As, as a woman from Sasun who immigrated to Istanbul, Huri viewed the encounters between Anatolian Armenians and the Armenians in Istanbul to be a, in a hierarchical relationship that denies the Armenianness of the Armenians of Sasun. She explains, you miss where you come from and it was not easy for us to stay in Sasun and it was not easy to live in Istanbul. My mother covers her hair, for example, from our looks and lifestyle, people think we are Kurds. In Istanbul, I live as a stranger to my own culture, and this culture is dying with me. My own heritage is dying. The Armenian dialect of Sasun is being forgotten. Once there was an event here in the Armenian church hall, and I sang in Armenian. Then one of the organizers told the audience, look at our girl. She came here with no knowledge of Armenian. Now she can sing in it. Hearing this, I felt uncomfortable and I replied back saying, I came to Istanbul with no knowledge of Turkish, but I did speak Armenian and Kurdish. And the guy replied back telling me, but your Armenian, your Sasun Armenian is not really Armenian. Some concluding remarks. Huri's life shows us that the Armenian catastrophe is a constellation of violent experiences. Such violence is not restricted to one uh, event or even one group. Many Armenians from Anatolia were denied their Armenianness by the Turkish state, by the Kurdish tribal leaders, and also by some Armenians in Istanbul. Here I want to evoke again the writings of Walter Benjamin on history, who on the eve of the German occupation of Paris in 1940, so in Paul Klee's 1920 painting, Angulus Novus, a metaphor for history. The angel is turned towards the past. Benjamin says, where we perceive a chain of events, he sees one single catastrophe, which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage and hurls it in front of his feet. That's in thesis nine on history. In this reading, Khoury's story became relevant not only to understand the unarchived Armenian experiences, but also the experiences of people and communities that continue to dwell in the afterlives of catastrophes, those who are denied a life so a nation state project could flourish. Such lives resist being archived and historicized. Benjamin's angel invite us to confront the multiple ghosts of catastrophic pasts. From settler colonialism to slavery, massacres, genocide, or other events of invasion, violence, and violation, not as separate incidents, rather, they inaugurate and propagate violent structures to ensure that the, that the violated remain dominated. Benjamin's metaphor runs against the grain of scholarly work done on post-Ottoman societies and in modern Armenian history, which largely privileged certain events such as genocide, each confined within a strictly demarcated time frame of a linear periodization. And it's very common we see in Armenian historiography uh, that it goes from empire, um, Ottoman Empire, genocide, diaspora, and ending, uh, teleologically always ending, the narratives always end within a nationalist uh, uh, context to building to a nation state, which is post-Soviet Armenia, uh, leaving out those who survived and continue to live with the consequences of erasures of the Turkish Republican regime. Armenian survivors in Turkey frustrate the perceived purity of both Turkish and Armenian societies and histories. For the Turkish state, Armenians were un the unwanted, as they are known in Turkey, the leftovers of the sword. From the perspective of the Armenians in the diaspora, the Armenians in Turkey were inconceivable. Armenians were either killed in the genocide or survived in the diaspora, but not in Turkey. What Huri's comment about the Armenian in Istanbul, uh, about, uh, uh, who did not recognize her Sasun dialect to be Armenian, tell us that Armenians leave Anatolia as Armenians 
to arrive in Istanbul as Kurds. But it does not stop there. An Armenian who immigrated from Turkey to France once told me, we leave Turkey as Armenians and arrive to France as Turks. Armenians of Anatolia could be Turks and Kurds, but not Armenian. Here, denativization becomes a critique of nationalist projects and their, and their practices of exclusion and destruction. And here, exclusion is not only from the state projects, but also from historical narratives. For Turkish nationalism, Huri's story highlights the barbaric aspect of the nation state project that is hailed even by some historians that the destruction was worthwhile for the modernity, progress, and secularity it brought in. And here I'm thinking of historians like Bernard Lewis, who's a genocide denier, but also of Eric Zürcher, who sees the, who hails the Turkish nationalist project as a success at the, towards the end of his book, Turkey, A Modern History. And it is, I don't know if it is coincidental that uh, October 29th also is the day that uh, the Turkish Republic was declared. So it is great to be speaking about that in terms of destruction. The Armenian survivors in Turkey become similar to the unwanted debris of destruction. Being conceptually unthinkable, they were impossible in the nation state centric imagination of the past. For whatever is unthinkable is also historiographically impossible. Yet Benjamin reminds us that the wreckage that herds in front of the angel feet is a testimony that the past is not dead or forgotten and carries the potential of being uh, reassembled to reappear and flash at moments of danger. The past and even the dead are not dead through the eyes of the angel of history. Indigeneity of denativized populations like Armenians did not uh, is more than loss of land. In fact, the focus on land is from, always from the perspective of the settler who wants the land without the people. Rather, the indigenous peoples, it is for indigenous peoples, it is also the complex loss of complex set of relationships, experiences that were formed on and with the land. Land here is not in the abstract and imaginative sense, rather it is the locale a particular place where experiences and relations emerged over time and specified norms, dialects, shared cultural cultures with other Armenians and non-Armenians that form a specific locale. For even when other Armenians speak about loss of land, they don't mean it in the national symbolic or imaginative sense like nationalist projects, rather they literally mean a land that they actually know have owned and continue to have ownership deeds of. Living in the shadow of lost, uh, lost and destroyed homelands, the Native American writer Leslie Silco once noted that Pueblo culture to which she belongs, people construct identities and belongings through the modern medium of storytelling. Benjamin reminds us that storytelling needs a community of people to whom the stories and experiences are being told and shared. Such relational belonging is practiced by many Armenians like Huri. For native peoples like the Pueblo, uh, individual identity is expressed by telling stories about, about what is important to the family and the intimate community to which they belong. They therefore produce their local interpretation of the past through storytelling and label, labeling. Storytelling also always happens in the present. And therefore, even though it speaks about the past, it does not belong to a different temporality. It is not a history in the capital H. Here I want to return to Huri to emphasize the genocide and expulsion from the perspective of the villagers of Sasun that is within a specific indigenous temporality that one told, than the one told by historians and Armenian activists as the Turkish word for the, 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 the Ferman, the first Ferman and the second Ferman uh, in, in a linear consequence from the first that reflects the way Huri and other, uh, uh, others in Sasun experience the, experience the genocide and interpret them as being related and consequential. For the villagers of Sasun, the Armenian catastrophe has a much longer temporality and is not limited to the legally and historically defined crime of genocide that took place uh, during World War I and ended in 1918. The next 30 seconds for Armenians 
Guri challenges the purity and standardized and homogenized image of the Armenian who is continuously framed by the genocide. The fact that Armenians survived and lived as Kurds in some parts of Anatolia or speak a non-written dialect of Armenian like Huri unsettles binaries of the nationalist projects and is reflective of the many contradictory ways of being Armenian in the age of post-Ottoman nation states. Let me note here that they would be considered contradictory only from the perspective of insular and simplified definition of what a national identity should and cannot be. Huri and other villagers of Sasun do not see themselves as contradictory. It is the Armenians and the Turks in Istanbul and the diaspora who would see them as such. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, I, with, with this uh, uh, conclusion, I would like to um, now uh, <laughs> invite Vlad to give his presentation. Uh, thank you, Azla. Um, so I'm very happy to be on this panel with Hakim and Azla. Um, and I, I'm really looking forward to the discussion afterwards. Uh, my paper will address the, the second part of the prompt or the panel title around affect, belonging, and memory. Um, and I will be talking about uh, anti-imperial rather than imperial pasts in the present. Um, and so let me just share my screen here. Okay, so. Okay. Okay, so um, so in other words, the socialist modernity of the title in my paper was um, articulated as a decolonial project against the imperial incursions in the Balkan region. In this sense, uh, it is um, telling that within the, uh, with the collapse of the socialist project and old imperial fault lines in the Balkans have asserted, asserted themselves once again fragmenting the region. I will start my paper now. Okay, um, Yugoslavia with strings attached. In recent years, we have seen an explosion of interest in the utopian ruins of the former second world, sleek and doctored photographs of brutalist architecture in various state of neglect circulate across social media and the internet, offering decontextualized spectacles of socialism's wreckage for global viewers in the form of clickbait. This fad has been both noted and tempered by the work of scholars, curators, artists, and amateur enthusiasts that critically foregrounds both the ideological aspirations that gave rise to socialist architectural modernism, as well as this shifting and increasingly threatened status within the post-socialist present. The 2019 exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York towards a concrete utopia, architecture in Yugoslavia, 1948 to 1980, organized by uh, Martino Stierli and Vladimir Kulic, represents perhaps the most spectacular outgrowth of this critical endeavor backed by a prestigious art, art institution while maintaining a political and scholar, scholarly edge. Here, the Yugoslav socialist modernism offers not just a brutalist spectacle, uh, but also materializes a forgotten, discarded ideological program, a quote-unquote concrete utopia spelled out to the international viewers in the text of the exhibition. Despite this edge, however, the blockbuster show has received criticism for its overly cool and institutional approach to an architectural heritage that for many self-identified Yugoslav, Yugoslavs remains a collective and emotionally charged object of nostalgia and ungrieved loss. While these critiques are at times overstated, they nevertheless point to the central role of photography as an affective medium in the visual and documentary staging of architecture. Thus, looking at um, uh, Valentin Jack's photographs of Yugos uh, Yugoslav socialist modernist architecture, which were overwhelmingly used in both the MoMA show in the exhibition, exhibition catalog, one can see why the transnational writer Dubravka Ugrasic describes the entire show in her 2020 essay, There's Nothing Here, as, quote, some sort of lavish tomb 
where flashes of my former life are being projected onto the wall, end quote. Indeed, by centering brutalist structures as isolated aesthetic objects removed from human subjects and living context, Jack's images threaten to obscure the situated histories, affects, and practices that still imbue Yugoslav um, architectural modernism with a range of oppositional meanings. In this paper, I turned to Boris Kral's photo diary, My Belgrade from 2011, to explore a different configuration of second world utopian ruins and visuality, one that is defined by architectural photography as an emotionally charged site of loss and potential recuperation of Yugoslav identity in the post-socialist now. The first person possessive pronoun in the title of Kral's photo diary foregrounds a nostalgic and intimate vision of socialist Yugoslavia. Slavia, while Belgrade marks its specific, if not distinctly overdetermined subject, the country's former capital and its symbolic and political center. Framed autobiographically as a personal diary, Kral's book captures the disappearing traces of socialist modernity, modernity as a series of wounds and traces amidst Belgrade's transitional cityscape staging a photographic allergy for the former country and its complex identity that is gradually being erased, thereby passing into a position of non-normativity. Specifically, I explore how Kral imbues the remaining traces of the socialist past with oppositional, affective, political, and sexual meanings, curating a melancholy portrait of the city undergoing a transition that is also a diasporic and queer self-portrait of the photographer. My Belgrade is informed by Kral's experience of growing up in the Yugoslav Gastarbeiter diaspora in West Germany, where effective attachments to the parents' socialist homeland were fostered from an early age, even as they marked him off as an ethnicized and class other. However, rather than retrieving a singular national origin or a lost homeland, Kral's book can be situated within a broader framework of what Gayatri Gopinath has termed quote, the aesthetic practices of queer diaspora, end quote. In her rich account of these predominantly visual practices, Gopinath especially singles out the role of photography in the creation of diasporic and emotionally charged archives, which, quote, produce forms of queer desire and, and identification across multiple temporalities and narrate the construction of queer selfhood and queer genealogies in non-teleological terms, end quote. Similarly, Kras Belgrade is a sliding and complex photographic signifier situated between text and image, diasporic and local perspectives, and between different temporalities, that this has been of the aorist and this will have been of the futur interieur, open, opening up wayward routes and queer angles of vision that unsettle the city's fixed location within the national frame. As Kral states in the informative interview that prefaces the book, quote, I started taking photographs because I was always uh, reminded of my upbringing. It's more a feeling that I get when I think of Belgrade, my childhood and my other side, rather than a capital city. Belgrade is the capital, uh, capital city of Serbia, but it's also a synonym for Yugoslavia, end quote. In contrast to MoMA's detached and globalizing institutional lens, my Belgrade thus offers an intensely intimate vision of socialist architectural modernism with strings attached, to use Ugrishic's apt phrase from the previously mentioned essay. Through photographs of mid-century high-rises, street portrait, portraits, dere uh, derelict urban signage, and socialist brands, Pride's photo diary, I argue, reveals a multi-layered and disappearing Yugoslav identity that is expressive of hybridity, sexual difference, and working class uh, culture. By examining the effective intentionality of these photographs, I hope to show how socialist era architecture and urban infrastructure in its present state can also accommodate queer feelings and temporalities, effectively queering the con concrete utopia of MoMA's exhibit. So my Belgrade is colored not only by a sense of personal loss, but also by a desire to visually expose and reclaim a spoiled Yugoslav identity that has been imbued with stigma in the aftermath of the country's violent dissolution. As in many diasporic Yugoslav biographies, the civil war in the 1990s marks a turning point for Kral, 
one that informs his melancholy impulse to document the remaining fragments of Yugoslav idea in the Serbian capital through the eminently elegiac medium of photography. As Kraj states in his interview, after the war there, I had the impression that a lot had changed with the people. They were bitter and there was great despair in the air. My relatives are scattered throughout the former Yugoslavia and all of them were separated due to war. Yet when I traveled to Belgrade again, the positive memories came back. I walked through the city and was always reminded of the country I knew as a child. I thought the city is magic. It really has this old Yugoslav spirit in the place and faces of the people. It was really, really very strong, like a flashback. I was confused and obsessed at the same time. For Kraj, the traces of Yugoslavia vividly recall alternative temporalities and modes of being together as a collective that are still visible on Belgrade streets, despite the recent history of violence, constituting an alternative and effective geography of the city. Indeed, one of the defining uh, features of Kraj's photographic diary is the emphatic presence of textual traces, commercial signage, street names, and wall writing within the photographic frame rather than in the captions. While well, the placement of images in the del deliberate series against the white frame gives the book a deceptively breezy and cinematic feel, this inclusion of textual traces forces the viewer to literally, literally read the city as a text and linger on the individual photographs, emphasizing their stillness and contemplative character. Placed in a sequence, these graphic and textual traces emerge as an emotionally charged diaristic script that demands to be read and felt before it becomes completely illegible. So through found text, double page composition, blank pages, uh, and carefully, careful attention to sequence, the spectator is asked to uh, actively reassemble what has been shattered by the violence of the war, foregrounding the act of looking as an act of reading as well as the uh, therapeutic and reparative aspects of the photo book as a work of mourning. An especially poignant example is a double page composition halfway through the book's image sequence with two juxtaposed photos of empty uh, storefronts. On the left-hand side, um, where primary colors, blue, red, and yellow dominate, the focal point is a white Skopje sign uh, in minimal uncertified uh, typeface underneath a closed blue uh, roll-up door. The opposing photo features complementary colors, yellow and lilac, while uh, visually centering the address of what appears to be an empty storefront, front, Zagrebačka uh, Va. Through these textual signs, the images reference the capitals of former Yugoslav republics, Macedonia and Croatia, respectively, which were cut off both physically and culturally from Belgrade during the 1990s war. The presence of Skopje and Zagreb in Belgrade evokes not only the presence of international solidarity and signs of non-antagonistic difference in the Balkans, but also stories of communities, families, friends, and neighbors that were violently severed by the war or excluded from new national communities because they found themselves on the wrong side of the imposed border. By bringing these place names within the same double frame, Kraj is able to visually reconnect the spaces, temporalities, and effective networks of socialist modernism that are increasingly being lost in the presence of the post-socialist transition. In this respect, the double-page layout is an especially powerful compositional device in my Belgrade, forcing the reader to make connections between images to suture the wounds across the white space of the double frame. Since Belgrade remains a space imbued with stigma associated with Serbian nationalism and violence of the 1990s wars, Kraj's photographic vision complicates this optic, showing a city that keeps unconsciously remembering its alternative socialist and international past, even if only at the fading margins of its urban script. Indeed, the effects of the post-socialist transition as a normalizing and normative process were particularly felt by Kraj on Belgrade streets as the city shifted from a Yugoslav to a Serbian capital in the first decade of the 21st century. During this period, iconic and textual markers of Yugoslav socialism, such as street names, socialist iconography, and other urban signage were either replaced or obscured by the new visibility of national symbols and the mushrooming, mushrooming of billboards advertising global consumer brands. As Tanya Petrovic has argued, Quote, characteristic for these transitional processes is semiotic chaos, the inflation of names, signs, and symbols on the one hand, which are very visible on the Belgrade streets, where one can find more than one street name on a certain building, 
and the radical erasure of everything that is connected to the socialist and Yugoslav inheritance on the other, end quote. This erasure of the socialist past, in other words, has left in its wake a sense of radical historical rupture, a symbolic void in the sense of loss that the new ideologies of market capitalism and ethnic nationalism haven't been able to completely co cover over. Aware of the urgency of this task to record Belgrade's changing landscape, Kraj states that, quote, the traces of Yugoslavia are disappearing. Wherever I go there, I see that something has gone. Many of the images in the book don't exist anymore. And I doubt that uh, anyone ever paid so much attention as I did, end quote. In this sense, the former country and its identity emerges in Kraj's photographs as a voided presence, a potentially illegible material trace of the past that is again imbued with new feelings and injected with oppositional meanings by the viewer in the present. Um, these fleeting traces of socialist modernity recur across the discontinuous and photographically fragmented space of the city as a, uh, as a punctum, or to paraphrase Bart, as magical emanations of the Yugoslav referent. The former countries recollected metonymically through its remaining fragments, such as quote, books in the flea market with pictures of Dubrovnik or Tito on the cover, or logos with old Yugoslav names, Yugo Tours, Yugo Electra, Yugo Spedition, the Yugoslav Drama Theater, which is still called that even though it is in Serbia and people don't think of themselves as Yugoslavs anymore. Thus, one of the first photographs that the viewer encounters in the book is that of the passing red Yugo Scala 55C taken by Kral in Belgrade traffic from the passenger seat of a car. In the image, the Yugo's iconic shape and red color bearing the name of the vanished socialist country flits by on the streets of Belgrade against the bright yellow background of the city bus. This photo is preceded by two photographs of Belgrade's vernacular and commercial street architecture, which function as establishing shots that situate the viewer in the post-socialist now. In contrast to the image of the Yugo, these socialist era shopping arcades are eerily empty, suggesting an ambiguous ideological and political vacancy in Serbia at the dawn of the new uh, millennium. Echoing Vesna Pavlovich's equally deadpan photographs of abandoned socialist hotels, these photos staged the now of the transition to Western style consumer capitalism as a potentially eternal in between us, a dead and static time, as it were. Um, they place the, uh, place the spectator in the position of waiting while opening up, as Branislav Dmitrievich puts it, a silent dialogue with the encountered objects themselves, end quote. In contrast to these images characteristic of Belgrade's cultural and ideological liminality, the photograph of the passing red Yugo constitutes an emotionally charged and semantically overdetermined photographic punctum. It embodies the book's effective epicenter that shifts across the space of the collection in the form of visual and textual rhymes. To invoke Walter Benjamin's notion of an image at a standstill, Yugoslavia's socialist modernity emerges here in the contemporary Serbian um, capital photographically as a genuine image of the past that flits by. Operating in an affective mode, Cries My Belgrade captures and renders, the, uh, renders legible the fleeting traces of Yugoslavia against the semiotic anarchy of the post-socialist transition, fossilizing them as unfulfilled promises of socialist modernity that could be recuperated in the present. By selecting and placing homo uh, homologous traces into the photographic frame and in relation to each other, Kraldas urges the viewer to recollect a shattered and fragmented Yugoslav idea, visually recomposing the disappearing socialist collective and Kraldas' former self within a broader multiplicity of urban signs. However, we might also venture to read the fleeting red Yugo as a queer object, one which is encountered in the words of Sarah Ahmed as slipping away, as threatening to become out of reach, end quote. Indeed, Ahmed's language of queer phenomenology allows us to see Kraj's Yugoslavia not only as a political and cultural space, but also as an increasingly non-normative and fleeting object of identification and effective attachment. One that, quote, risks departure from the straight and narrow, makes new futures possible, which might involve going astray, getting lost, or even becoming queer, end, end quote. 
Both of these meanings are metonymically captured in Christ's photographs of the red Yugo that is receding into the distance and about to disappear from our line of sight, arresting motion and stillness. This concern is also evident in Christ's other uh, artistic projects um, um, connected to Yugoslavia, such as uh, a video titled The, the You Spirit that accompanied the My Belgrade exhibit. Uh, exhibit. In the video, Kraj walks around Belgrade and interviews people from different backgrounds, asking them whether anything of the former country has survived, both in their sense of self and in the city's identity as a, as a whole. Like in the photo diary, the punctum, an emotionally charged and materialized memory of Yugoslavia, surfaces periodically amidst this continuous flow of spoken language, constituting another kind of recorded trace of the vanishing country. Just like in my Belgrade, the different feel of Yugoslavia, a sense of loss and fleeting alterity emerges against the general babble of urban speech. Uh, Kral additionally zeroes in on this difference in another promotional video for an exhibit at the Museum of Yugoslavia in Belgrade stating, but I like being different. I like being Yugoslav. Occupying a voided Yugoslav identity indeed marks Kral as different, especially against the normative pressure to align himself with one of the uh, national identities currently in offer. As an oblique subjectivity and feeling, which is increasingly becoming strange, Kral's internal Yugoslavia this reads also as a queer orientation. As Ahmed notes, if queer is also an orientation towards queer, a way to approach what is retreating, then what is queer might slide between sexual orientation and other kinds of um, orientation. Here would become a matter of how one approaches the object that slips away, a way to inhabit the world at the point at which things fleet. The foot of the red yugo, which visually captures a fleeting object as much as Kral's receding and increasingly idiosyncratic subjectivity, suggests one way in which we might uh, view my Belgrade and yugo nostalgia more broadly as a queer orientation. Opening up queer angles, and here I'm concluding, Opening up queer angles on the socialist past, Kral's images mark a difference from the violently corrective lens of the nation state while recalling socialist Yugoslavia's non-alignment with the straight lines of international modernism. From such a queer angle, we might also venture to read the failure of the Yugoslav project in spite and because of the scope of its tragedy as a queer failure. Quote, a history of alternative political formation, which, as Jack Halberstam points out, quote, allow us to access traditions of political action that, while not necessarily successful in the sense of becoming dominant, do offer modes of constantation, rupture, and discontinuity for the political present. Uh, and I would just like to say that uh, my reading focused more on this kind of phenomenological queerness as an orientation. But uh, later in this chapter, I read more fixed traces of queerness uh, in, this, uh, in this book, and I'm happy to talk about that uh, in the discussion. Um, thank you. I couldn't unmute myself, sorry. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much uh, uh, to both of you. Um, it was very... Um, Evocative, and I was actually struck by how much, uh, even if you positioned yours as an anti-imperial, um, or maybe one that is against the empire, and yet recollecting something, um, uh, and through the fragments, just like the Armenian case, um, it, it was quite uh, interesting in that regard. And so I wanted to... Um, uh, make a few comments and then we'll ask you to maybe respond or to comment to each other on each other's work and then before we open the floor for discussion to Q&A. Um, so uh, when, when we talk about, because the session is also entitled um, the new directions of research, so I think uh, one question that I wanted to ask for all of, uh, for all of us actually is that, um, you know, your work engages in both cases how the past is uh, recovered or reconsidered, revisited in the present. 
But in the case of uh, the uh, Armenian genocide survivors, this is a kind of a different kind of a story. It of, there's a different additional layer and a context of that present imprinted in their present. Um, so I, what I wanted to ask you is um, how far do we go in the past uh, in seeking different legacies um, uh, and, um, uh, and also tainted with extermination in both cases actually, right? Um, of different groups, uh, one addressed as genocide and the other either as ethnic cleansing or as civil war, right? Um, and how, how do we um, address these uh, beyond the scope of nationalism. So I think that you both offered quite a bit uh, to, to think with in that regard. So that's just one, one um, uh, point that I wanted to make. And the second point I wanted to make is that um, specifically, uh, these are the regions that contain historically remarkably uh, di like diverse groups, different groups, right? I'm not trying to use diverse as an anachronistic category, but as to describe the, as a descriptive of the um, multiplicity, multiple backgrounds uh, at place. And yet after the collapse of uh, different states, empires in the region, what we see is and uh, in the process of them, them being replaced with na like uh, ethno-national states, right? Um, what we do see is uh, the prioritization of certain identification over the others. Um, uh, and um, you uh, address that uh, in terms of uh, the unwanted or the undesirables, right? Um, uh, Hakim. So in the case of former Yugoslavia, um, its end is also marked by violence. And what can we be said about the underlying logics of such violence and how they are being addressed through such recuperations in the present? Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and actually, uh, I know that you are trying to bring a different kind of uh, reading to this, uh, both of you in different ways, but I just wanted to hear more about uh, how you would address this as a, as a future research question as well as uh, in this case. And then, um, and then the third point I wanted to make was, is that um, uh, what does the terms of revisiting the uh, past, in what terms that past is being revisited, reconsidered, reconfigured, um, as your interlocutors and subjects of study do, um, and that which you address in terms of intersections of, uh, through the intersections of categories, um, uh, so what do these terms of revisiting of the past tell us about the context of the present or the multiple presents, um, uh, which informs this vision and experiences of your in, uh, interlocutors and subjects situated in that particular present of enunciation or photographing. So uh, I, and this I am also thinking about Walter Benjamin, um, uh, where he is saying that uh, any representation of the past tells us more about the present than the past itself. So, uh, and I don't mean to say that there was, you know, no genocide, of course, that's not what I mean. But what I'm saying is, what does that tell us about the possibilities and options open to us? And, and there's a particular question I have here because um, in, and I don't want to bring it solely to uh, violence, but it is ingrained in both of your talks. So I am just going to bring it back here is that, um, this discussion about catastrophe, how historically these uh, notions are addressed in terms of catastrophe, Metziagern in Armenian, uh, Nakba uh, in Palestine, and then you have also like um, a Shoah, right, the, the Holocaust. So it, they're all addressed in terms of catastrophe or in the context of Greece, the catastrophe, right, like the, 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 the uh, 1922. Um, and so like, and, it, and yet it removes the agency of the human uh, uh, <laughs> uh, subjects who were part of this action, part of this act. And so I just also wanted to ask about the possibilities of using different categories and categorizations and what do they obscure and what do they highlight? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and in that regard, what kind of intersectionality can we discuss within the context of the present? Thank you. This is just a few things to put on the table. You don't need to address them, but uh, 
in case you want to say something about them, but these are what it evoked in me. Should I name someone or? <laughs> um, Maybe. Okay, um, Vlad. <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much for your uh, comments and questions. Uh, I see a lot of interrelated questions here, uh, so I might skip over some and address some others. Um, so what struck me is this question of <clears throat> these territories or regions with so-called mixed populations that have been very violently unmixed, right, in certain periods, uh, namely the, the post-Ottoman period uh, and the formation of the nation state. And then as I had uh, addressed at the beginning of my paper very briefly, right, that those kind of imperial fault lines were actually um, once again uh, mobilized uh, in the 1990s with the collapse of Yugoslavia. So it is as if Yugoslavia had kept those histories in a sense frozen or suspended for a period of time through its um, specific kind of structures, right, of, of socialist, uh, what, what, you know, uh, scholars have been calling socialist modernity or this kind of alternative modernity, et cetera. Um, so this question of, you know, types of difference and how, and questions of managing difference and how these different structures have managed difference, I think still persists very much. And I see that both in scholarship uh, around, I mean, this is why this is kind of an exciting discussion because these regions are often not placed together in dialogue, even though they do have kind of these shared pasts, as it were. And so similar sort of um, issues come up, right? And a lot of them have to do with this kind of uh, the fallout of empire and the problems with the nation state formation, uh, especially in, in regions of, you know, mixed or hybrid populations. Um, so my approach to that is uh, in a sense that Yugoslavia does offer an alternative model of, you know, living with difference. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if that model necessarily can be completely recovered in the present in its sort of um, integral form. But I think that as, uh, you know, as these forms kind of decay and become traces, they can be recuperated or they, they give us a kind of an index of something that has been unrealized in kind of these Benjaminian terms. Um, but right, they would have to, in order to, uh, in order to sort of reassemble, right, the collective that has been shattered, I think that one would have to, you know, do that within the confines of the present. Uh, so not, necessarily repeating what was, but, uh, but really taking the present into account. Um, my, um, so, so in a sense, Krai's project is, you know, only discursive in a limited way. And I tried to make it a little more discursive than he does in his project, right? It's kind of a visual narrative that he's putting together that involves the reader in uh, this act of reassembling, right? What has been shattered. Um, but in many ways, these traces are also kind of mute in many ways. And, you know, my job as, a, as kind of a critic was to both show how there's kind of this emptying of going on of these old forms and how this emptying is also making possible new kinds of meaning as well. 
Uh, and one of those meanings that I wanted to um, kind of bring out is, is this kind of queerness, this kind of form of difference around queerness. And I didn't show, I didn't show a sort of uh, some of the graffiti that was present in uh, uh, in this ph photography collection kind of pointed to this alternative and queer Belgrade as well uh, that um, that uh, Kral was uh, capturing along with these signs of um, the socialist iconography and the socialist text, right? So in many ways, what was very fascinating to me about this project was uh, how to, so what, after this rupture, after this, so these socialist, uh, these socialist forms kind of disappear or, or are drained of meaning, um, there's kind of a void created. How do we fill that void in a way? How, what comes after? Is there something or is it just right? Is it just this kind of uh, catching up with the West narrative, right? Um, or, you know, kind of the delayed nation state? Is that what comes after? Uh, I think that there's these kind of cracks that appear that point to different possibilities, different, uh, different kind of routes to um, that sort of skirt or displace the national frame. Um, and here, right, this is done aesthetically, primarily uh, through narrative means. Um, you know, I did not really address the kind of material conditions that are necessary, right? Um, we're talking about sort of symbolic, uh, symbolic forms uh, that would need to be in place or that need to be struggled for, right? For, uh, for an alternative model of, of uh, community and governance to to emerge in the former Yugoslavia for sure. This is this is very interesting because what remains is the scripts scattered around material culture or built environment, uh, and it's like a and it's almost the the signifier and the signified. There, there is definitely a gap, and you address that very interestingly. I think also on the page itself, how they are juxtaposed or the or the lack of. Uh, the empty page next to one of those photos. So um, thank you so much. Um, and um, and uh, do you have anything that you would like to add um, uh, to the conversation, Hakim? I don't know, in response to this. You're mute. Uh, yeah, I have a lot. I mean, you provoked, you know, very, very good uh, questions that really goes in the heart of, of, of uh, what we've been doing. But but let me just say a couple of maybe fragmented uh, kinds of, uh, of, of comments. I, listening to Vlad's paper, uh, I couldn't help to think of, uh, you know, it's the first time I say this word. I mean, the, the if I may, uh, the queerness of the Armenian existence in Turkey. And here I'm thinking about uh, an essay by uh, Chandan Reddy uh, on the queer of color critique where he speaks about the queer of color uh, as, as, as uh, being uh, unthinkable uh, and being easily disposable and in, inhuman in that sense. Uh, and it frustrates the, 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 the color or the, the, the critical race theory as well as critiques queer theory. So it's like launching critique on both, uh, on both fronts. And here I was, I kept, I couldn't help but think about how the, the Armenian existence in Turkey that really becomes that, uh, that kind of uh, uh, those who do not fit on both sides of a hyphenated identity in the aftermath of, of, uh, of the imperial demise and the, and the nation. So the Armenian frustrates the desire for a clearly marketed definition. And that's why someone like Huri or the Armenians of Sasun uh, you know, challenge the very definition of, of, of Armenianness, Kurdishness, and Turkishness, the social boundaries and the political uh, borders between the different communities. Such desires have been both uh, have the uh, both the means for and the byproduct of the nation uh, the nation uh, state order. So here I'm thinking about you know launching 
and, and I think here in terms of Edward Said's work, how critique is always future oriented. I mean, what, what we are interested in, or basically how far do we go in terms of the past? Uh, uh, it really depends uh, uh, on, on the political commitment of the present. So I would invoke the past as a, as a way of critiquing uh, the point in, in the present. The fact that we are continuously living in the shadow of uh, the, the catastrophes of the nation state that are continuous, are, are, are continuous. So what happened to, to Armenians uh, uh, when what happened to the European Jewish communities, what happened in Rwanda, uh, continues to be happened to the Roma people in Europe, continues to happen on the borders of the United States, the borders of uh, 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 the, 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 the Greek islands with Turkey, the borders of Europe in Malta and, 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 and Italy. I mean, these are, continue to be, uh, continue to be um, the, 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 the perceived ideas that somehow we can conceive of a demographic purity. And, and here, I mean, how, do, how far do we go? I mean, we can go with the rise of nationalism, but some scholars have been taking that question back to 1492, where the ethnic cleansing of the Iberian Peninsula of its Muslims and Jewish communities happened in the very same year as the arrival of Columbus and the beginning of the annihilation of the indigenous populations of the Americas, something that Ella Shohat has brilliantly, uh, brilliantly uh, written about. Uh, so the past, uh, so my, my uh, so 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 then every point becomes a new beginning. So 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 recovering genocide. Uh, recovering the 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 the, uh, 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 the end of the uh, of Yugoslavia, uh, not as an end with a rupture, but as a new beginning. So there is a rupture uh, in 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 every end, but there is a new beginning at every end. So then we go outside of the framework of the episodic history that you know Yugoslavia has ended, and now we have. Uh, we have nationalism. Uh, Turkey, the Ottoman Empire has ended and, 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 and so on and so forth. But the, the Armenian genocide, uh, we recover that history that, and to, to say that the genocide is not only a finality of lives, but it has inaugurated a po different possibilities of survival. And this is, I think, a very uh, way of looking at, at, uh, at, at human, human nature that even in death and destruction, there are always new lives and new ways as, uh, 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 to be formed. And back to the Benjamin's uh, uh, angel of history, the, the wreckage, once they are just being waited to be reassembled. I mean, the, uh, with, with the, the story of, uh, of Huri or the story of the red uh, Yugo, which you know, I find fascinating, it just reminds me of Cairo, by the way, blood of the, of the, of the, the, the in, in, in old um, black and white films in Egypt uh, to uh, become uh, really, uh, they, they, they become, once they are reassembled, they become themselves a critique of the present uh, the critique in the present. And the critique in, in the present is always a future oriented already. So here we got rid of the temporality between past, present and future in, in just launching this kind of critique. I'll stop here so we can give the audience some opportunity. There, there, yes, there are currently no questions. So <laughs> uh, I would like to invite the audience members to write their uh, questions if they have any to the Q&A section under, uh, under the screen. Uh, and, um, and meanwhile, while waiting for questions to emerge, I can also uh, uh, articulate that basically in every um, rupture, there is continuity in every continuity, there is rupture. There is no such, I think, um, like, like maybe there is death, but there are always afterlives of that death and, it, and that death can be extended with those afterlives and how the terms of those afterlives are actually implemented. So I think, uh, and honoring survivorship, I think is very important, I agree. Um, and there are still no questions. So where do you see the new research going from, uh, from here? Like the, since this is the rubric also, new directions of research. I will, I will tell you when there are questions from the audience. I, I'm looking at it. 
So I, you know, I was really struck, uh, Hakeem, by your, um, you know, unsettling of the uh, the victim, sort of, uh, you know, victimizer binary, uh, and how, in a sense, there there is a sense of right, the sort of both the. Um, uh, the generations, right, coming after, you know, the victims and the perpetrators having to live together, right, in the same space. And uh, this question, I think, becomes, you know, I think becomes pretty important, uh, even as it, you know, even as it, uh, it brings up, you know, certain kinds of sensitive issues, right? Uh, uh, but, you um, I think thinking about trauma as also having a certain kind of uh, potential that there are these remains of catastrophe and that can be uh, in fact sort of used, right? To construct something new uh, or to unsettle the, uh, the orders, the sort of pre-existing orders for example, the, uh, the order of the ethnic nation state. Um, um, I think there's a lot of really interesting work in memory studies with Michael Rothberg and implicated subjects, uh, sort of looking at wider sort of networks of violence and uh, forms of implication, uh, you know, that, that have tried to, uh, to kind of unsettle that binary as well. Uh, by sort of placing it in, in kind of a network environment. Um, um, so I don't know where my specific project uh, fits, in, fits into this uh, specific uh, uh, framework. Uh, I think because I'm looking at, you know, Karadis coming from this diasporic perspective in many ways, uh, but, right, he does acknowledge that, you know, his family is kind of mixed, right? So, uh, you know, the only identity he can occupy is this kind of voided Yugoslav identity that gives him this rare sort of subject position where he can actually, um, right, perceive, uh, he can perceive, uh, you know, losses, not just of one you know, ethnic group, but also of, you know, of others as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've been thinking, I mean, I'll, I'll just, you know, to be very uh, uh, honest with how I feel, I, I, you know, nationalism and the nation state projects that we continue to live in is something that I battle with every day. I mean, I, I, and, and, and I think if, if there is one way I would like to see myself go is how can we start thinking outside of the gravity of nation state? Uh, because I think this is where, where a lot of, you know, from the critique of, critique of capital to the critique of violence to the critique of human rights as a discourse is, uh, is, is we are still bound by that uh, strong, uh, gravity. Even when we're critiquing nation states, we're still bound by some of its terminology. We can't just escape it. So, you know, <laughs> this is something that, you know, if I may say, you know, fighting or battling with nation states every day. So one, one of the things, I mean, when talking about new, 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 new directions uh, that uh, Asli uh, thought about is, you know, can we then write outside of the, of, the, of the nation state gravity by, and practically it means uh, writing outside of uh, liberal multiculturalism that also includes the victim in a depoliticized way, okay? So, so like, I mean, a concrete example would be the way Armenians and Armenian music and uh, uh, the rooms, the Greeks in Turkey and their music and their culture and the Jew, Jews of the Ottoman Empire were all incorporated in a multicultural setting in, uh, in, in Turkey, uh, uh, but without 
uh, without the violence of the past, the injustice of the past. So now, okay, let's start anew. And then, you know, even, even the, the, the few, there are once I was traveling on Turkish airlines and they had the Armenian church in Van, the Akhtamar church on the cover of the magazine of Turkish airlines. And then you read the article and it says, it only mentions once that it was an Armenian church. We have no, it was completely divorced of history. We don't know when it was used. Everything is archived to a distance past that without dates. And we don't know what happened to the Armenians and we shouldn't know, right? It is, you know, you visit it and then the article was about the great breakfast items of Van, for example. I mean, so this kind of liberal multiculturalism that divorces the, the, the celebration of diversity, since we're talking about diversity too, from the histories of violence. And the second would be, and it very much relates because it feeds into it, is the question of nationalism. And the question of nationalism and multiculturalism in, in that context celebrates and reemphasizes a Turkish national narrative uh, that Anatolia is ultimately Turkish. And when we celebrate our, an Armenian church, that's because how good we are as a state. So, and yeah. if we are celebrating the Armenian, uh, uh, the Armenian church, uh, how can you accuse us of genocide? Right? And the third would be imperial nostalgia that also the, the Ottoman Empire becomes interesting only we're celebrating how Istanbul is a bridge between East and West for the consumption of, of Western European and American tourists. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's very uh, complicated. And as you say, it on, reduces um, difference to uh, uh, politics of visibility, but not one that hierarchizes um, certain things and while well, obfuscating, generating a new kind of smoke screen as it were. Um, we have, thank you very much to both. Um, we have two questions right now. So we have one question from an anonymous attendee um, who says, uh, thank you both so much for these insightful presentations. Two questions for, one for Professor Al Rostom. Uh, you mentioned that several Armenians were denativized in France as well. Was this at the hands of the um, French government? Other Armenians who were or became part of the diaspora or both? And for Professor Beronia, um, this may not be central to your research, but is there a queer phenomenology of Yugoslavia outside Belgrade as well? Uh, either in more provincial Serbia or in either, uh, other former Yugo spaces? And, um, and I just want to add a second question uh, here that was already asked as well. Um, I would like a transcript of this, sorry. <laughs> My question, this is from, uh, I hope I'm reading this correctly, Chasida Fried. Um, my question is, uh, has anyone specifically, uh, I think, address linguistic genocide other than Tov Skutnap, uh, Kansas? I think it is very important to any global study of genocide, so. Uh, Asla, can you, can you just repeat the last one again? I didn't get the question. Uh, my, uh, yes, I think there is, uh, my question is, has anyone specifically, and I believe address, uh, linguistic genocide other than uh, Tob mm. Skutnap Kansas. I think it is very important to any global study of genocide. So this brings us back to the genocide convention, of course. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so the, the first questions, uh, let's have your answer, uh, Hakim, and then- Sure. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good question. And I write about it in another uh, chapter of my forthcoming book. And I argue, yes, because I'll tell you an encounter. Yes, that Armenians were denativized in that sense by, uh, by the Armenian diasporic communities. So when I first started my research in France and I met uh, an Armenian that I later discovered that very, she has uh, very nationalist sentiments about being Armenian. And I asked her about the, uh, the I said the word Turkophone Armenians. And, uh, and, and she said, oh yeah, let me tell you about those Turks. So I was, first of all, very uh, 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 surprised that she referred to them as Turks. And she said, well, there is nothing to know about them. They just come from Turkey, know nothing about the genocide, know no Armenian, and they come here uh, speaking in Turkish, watching Turkish television, 
And uh, a couple of weeks ago, back then, 2009, she said, uh, uh, two women were entering the Armenian church on a Sunday, speaking in Turkish, and then another French Armenian heard them speak in Turkish and told them, well, we are here, so we don't hear that language, so stop using Turkish. So, so well, f so first of all, the, 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 the living in the shadow of genocide in Turkey and not knowing about the genocide, but of course they know about the genocide, but they don't know about the genocide in the way the Armenian diaspora presented as a set of facts. Uh, uh, but, but, but as we saw from the story of Huri, they obviously know the genocide so much, they're still living it in a lot of ways and they refer to it in local terms. So on one side, so that kind of denativization happens, but being but by the Armenianness that continued living in the land of the perpetrator, which is also their homeland, uh, is denied from an authentic Armenian experience in a diasporic space. The other part, she told me, but when we hear about an Armenian coming from the Kranagert, which is the Armenian word for the now Kurdish city of Diyarbakir, we feel very happy. We feel that as if they are coming to us from history books. And here we can put it together is that an Armenian from the Kranagert, an Armenian from, from Diyarbakir invokes the, the, the golden age of Armenian history that is the medieval and the ancient, which is not unsimilar to the way the Akhtamar church on that Turkish airline magazine also puts the Armenian, uh, our, uh, the Armenian uh, buildings and, and remnants to the ancient and the medieval. So what both of them end up doing is that the Armenian in the present is denied the Armenianness, and therefore both of them are denied, the, are depoliticized. And this is my contention with with, with both as working within a nationalist framework. So I'm trying to you know, use the word uh, denativized uh, in order to, to you know, escape that uh, depoliticized uh, or the, 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 as I call it, the, the gravity of nationalism that is feeding into, uh, into uh, in, in the Armenian and Turkish discourses. And, and bring the Turkish, the, sorry, the Armenian experience uh, uh, that is denied existence without, with that, within, that, within, within that binary, because they are re really in the, in the, 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 the I like the, the, when Vlad uses the word, the cracks. I mean, the, those Armenians are really a crack. If we want to imagine two buildings or a building that is cracked in two parts of nationalism, then the Armenians in Turkey become, are, are occupying that, that ambiguous gap that everyone wants, wants to get rid of. But at the same time, they become uh, a productive way to launch a uh, uh, critique of nationalism and multiculturalism and, and also the diaspora, the Armenian diaspora nationalism that evolved without a, a successful nation state. Thank you. I think the crack is valid for everybody. <laughs> Um, this is what happens when um, the, a remarkably diverse area is tried to be like categorized, like and um, disciplined under like what like singular categories. When there are so many multiple multiple realities, even under one singular category. So uh, thank you for that. And um, uh, Vlad, would you like to answer the question as well? And um, before we move forward. Uh, sure. Yes. So um, I think, first of all, I, I, I also want to mention, right, the, the issue of genocide in Serbia is still a very much a current topic um, vis a vis uh, Srebrenica and, uh, you know, genocide against uh, Bosnian Muslims. So uh, just recently, right, the parliament denied a hearing on, you know, the naming of genocide. Uh, in Serbia, and then there's kind of a darker, another dark aspect to the story of the Yugoslav legacy being used for. Um, uh, there was a news. There was a news item recently about uh, Vucic, president of Serbia, using the non-aligned networks that were formed during the socialist Yugoslavia as kind of a third block in the Cold War 
for for you know um, weapons trading. Uh, so um, it's interesting how these gaps, right? How these, uh, these this infrastructure of socialism is now being used in all these uh, ways, right? To support nationalist project or um, uh, or you know sort of shady shady sort of schemes uh, involving you know weapons trade. Um, but uh, in terms of the very specific question uh, around, um, I think it's about, you know, Belgrade being sort of the center of um, uh, sort of queer cultural production, maybe. Uh, so uh, there has been a book, uh, a collection recently published in Serbia. Well, not that recently. Uh, I think it's from about seven or eight years ago called Mejunama Between Us uh, about writing queer history of Serbia and Yugoslavia. And uh, it also uses this concept of traces uh, rather, so rather than uh, using Western identity categories, uh, uh, which sort of came into use with, you know, globalization and, uh, uh, you know, 21st century, um, it's kind of an archaeological project that tries to recover certain kind of traces of queerness uh, in order to articulate a queer future against the kind of normativity of the ethnic nation state. Uh, and uh, um, very much part of this project is, um, is, is, uh, resisting certain kind of uh, borders and boundaries that have been imposed during the 1990s and the, uh, uh, you know, the um, occupation, right? The capitalist reconstruction and uh, nationalization of uh, the Yugoslav region. Uh, so I would say, and they hit, you know, I think mostly it's focused on urban centers, but there is, a gesture to look at, uh, you know, rural areas or so-called provinces as well, uh, right? Because modernization projects in the Balkans uh, were also very much uh, heteronormative as well. So rural forms or pre-modern forms of life actually uh, accommodated more fluid sort of sexual practices. Thank you so much. This is it had you had finished, right, Vlad? I didn't. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so before we conclude, I just want to have like uh, this last question to be answered, and uh, I'd like to thank um, uh, the the, uh, the one of our um, members of the audience. Um, again, I hope I'm reading the name correctly. Chesty the Fried uh, now corrected the name. Tov Skutnap Kangas, uh, uh, who worked on uh, the linguistic genocide. And the question was, do you know anyone else who has done some work on this subject? Um, oh, one second. I mean, I can just say one thing about that. Uh, I don't know on the top of my head right now about linguistic genocide, but I just want to emphasize since uh, uh, Chasida mentioned the word the global study of genocide, I think what is, what, you know, for me, what is important is to, you know, understand that genocides happen or actually the invention of race as a grammar of subjugation can happen with uh, with physical or physical visibility like a skin color or you know a different shape of a nose or a cheekbones or whatever uh, uh, but it can also happen and it, it has happened like in Rwanda in 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 uh, in, uh, in uh, Yugoslavia and uh, the Ottoman Empire when people really look alike so so the the the, the what is important to note here is that the grammar of difference that turn certain people with a particular traits, visible or invisible, into killable sub, 
uh, objects. I think this is where 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 we need to 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 focus on. So in in a way to redeem the idea of race that it can it as a although we know it that it's not biological fact by now, but we still use the word race in terms of uh, in terms of uh, of uh, of something that we can visibly see, particularly if we're working within an American uh, context of, uh, of uh, racial maps. But when once we go to Africa and the Middle East and the Balkans, uh, you know, we find the same happening, but then the language, it's the same grammar, but the language we use is employed in a different way. There are always ways of creating, creating a hierarchical difference that turns certain people killable. And this is, I think, what we need to uh, to focus on because if it's not language, it's religion. If it is not both, it is actually both. It, it is class. It is uh, religious affiliation, sectarian affiliation. And we we've seen it in the long history of uh, violence since the emergence of uh, of nation states in in Europe and in the ex colonies. And also the con like concept of cultural genocide not being included, for example, uh, in its final version. Of the genocide convention right so i think uh, it's that there, there is there is much going on there and uh, this is this is really um thank you so much <laughs> uh vlad do you have anything that you would like to add before i conclude i i don't think so not not specifically on um on this this specific uh, linguistic genocide topic, uh, right. I think I think that uh, overall there is actually much more to talk, talk uh, about um, for the audience members. This is our actually like I think third meeting, right? Um, because we met several times, and every time there are new uh, directions generated in each conversation. And, um, and I'm uh, very uh, grateful to have had this, um, uh, to have had this. Um, and uh, there is uh, another uh, comment here from Chasida Fried. Thank you. I am researching the Sami people, uh, culture and language, and I have learned that similarity in phenotype is not a barrier. Please send me the uh, link of, uh, to your work. And I think that Hakim is already answering that. Um, so. I am actually going to uh, conclude the session here um, using my power as the moderator uh, now that I have it uh, for once. And, um, and I would like to uh, thank our uh, presenters and uh, all the uh, institutions and, uh, that have supported and made this uh, event and co-sponsored and made this event possible and, uh, and to everybody who attended today. Thank you. Thank you, Asli. Thank you, Vlad. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for showing up and coming. <laughs>